Hello and welcome back to How It's Done. We are here with Mark and it's been a while since we've talked. It's been what since November um, 14th that we spoke with Jessica Brown who recently um, at that time a little before that left headquarters of Restore Church of God and then um, we last spoke one-on-one, -on -one, which was uh, September, so it's it's been a while, so we have some updates. Yeah, there's a lot that's been happening in the Restored Church of God. Thank you, Don, for having me again. Yeah, Jessica was, uh, she was kind of the tip of the iceberg as far as, um, you know, really inspiring people, and after her departure and then her interview, subsequent interview on, on World um, WCTV and how it's done, she got a lot of positive response, and she had people that she had been friends with a long time in Restore Church of God and lost contact with, who reached out to me on how to get a hold of Jessica. And then some people, um, you know, contacted her directly, but she got a lot of support from folks for for speaking her voice and being able to have the courage to get up and, you know, put her name or face on something that could, you know, potentially be very it could be, it could turn out badly for you if, you know, you get the wrong criticism or being seen as an accuser or seen as somebody who's just vindictive and, and bitter. And I don't think she came across that way because she's not, she's just really a, a sweet person. And I know that she has been picking up the pieces of her life since, and she is doing, she's doing well. She's actually doing well. So that was very cathartic for her, like it was for me to be on your show and to talk. And, you know, I know she really appreciated the opportunity to do that and it's had a positive outcome for her. So um, you've had recently two headquarter employees leave. There were two in, yes, in the past couple of months, there were two more headquarters employees who left. Jessica was a member of the headquarters congregation, but two members of the headquarters staff left. And one of them left around Thanksgiving quitting the job, but then later dissolving, becoming, um, being a member. And then somebody else in January just resigned and quit everything all in one day. And both of those people have decided to remain private, but there are two people that I knew very well. It was very happy to leave. You know, other people wrote me, it's like, wow, I hope these two people leave and wake up. And, and those are the ones that did. So they're picking up the pieces from their lives and trying to move on. And as all we all have to do, you're basically destroying your life as you know had known it, and you're rebuilding it again. And it's it's a very dramatic um, change to walk away from a church of God like the Restored Church of God. You are so embedded and ingrained into what you're doing and believing it full blown, and you're reading your Bible and you're studying and you're serving and you're sacrificing. And then to come to realization that the leadership is failing you and that the pastor general of the Restore Church of God is a false apostle, a false prophet. And once you come to that realization, it rocks your foundation and your whole world is, is you know, basically shattered and crumbled. And I know some people today who just can't even listen to the sound of David C. Pack's voice because it triggers them with like almost PTSD flashbacks like, oh, I remember the feeling that way. So different people respond in different ways. But the two, the two headquarters people leaving who happen to both be from the same department, I know crippled them for, for a time. They recovered. They're you know going to shift staff and all that. But it, it was a big deal that they left. And I was happy they left just on a personal level. Now, has he still been setting dates? Yes. Yeah, so for those who don't know, um, or this is there happens to be part 10 happens to be, wait, is this, this part nine? Nine. Part nine happens to be the, the first interview that they've seen. I was a former member and employee of the Restored Church of God, their pastor general is David C. Pack, and pretty consistently since 2019, he's been setting dates for the return of Jesus Christ. Here we are in April of 2023, and that has still not come to pass, and so therefore, by definition, he is a false prophet. When you prophesy a date for the return of Christ and it doesn't happen, that just proves you're false. The Bible doesn't allow do-overs. You get one shot. And so he's been disqualified forever, according to the Bible, to be able to keep doing this. But yeah, he's been doing this quite a bit. Um, since we last spoke, that was in uh, mid-November, Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, more recently on uh, Esther's Fast, known as Purim, uh, in March, March 6th. 
And then very recently, April 1st, April 5th, April 7th, <laughs> April 12th, and now and now the current one as of April 21st is Cinco de Mayo. So can you explain to those that um, maybe you're new or those who are forgot what these dates technically mean and were supposed to only happen? So th- no man knows the day and the hour for the return of Jesus Christ. That's pretty common knowledge, and that's a very famous scripture. What David C. Pack is doing is he is teaching different machinations of whatever is the nearest thing. He finds the verses that support the idea. When I said Cinco de Mayo or um, Christmas, it's not necessarily because of those dates as we know them. It's because that in the Hebrew calendar, certain numbers line up, that there are various, uh, you know, there's different months in Hebrew And he does calculations based on the scriptures, based on the timing of where we're at. He finds verses that suddenly pop and are suddenly clear to him that point to, oh, ABIB 21. Now, ABIB 21 could be, you know, just another day to you. But every once in a while, it happens to land on a day like April Fool's. Like I when he when he declared the date, I looked it up on, you know, my Google calendar that has the Hebrew dates and found out it was April 1st. I'm like, oh, man, he did not look that up because that is hilarious that a false <laughs> prophet is setting a date on April Fool's Day. And I even wrote about, you know, April Fool that David C. Pack was going to be April Fool and he was and all the members of the Restored Church of God. So setting the dates for the return of Jesus Christ is a ongoing seven, you know, since 2019, pretty solidly. So it's been four years running. There are annual religious holidays, holidays, holy days in the Hebrew calendar, like Passover, Unleavened Bread, Trumpets, Pentecost, Atonement, etc. Those are usually dates of focus. But every once in a while, he floats around the Hebrew calendar and lands on a day that just so happens to be Cinco de Mayo. It's not because it's Cinco de Mayo. It's because that in the Hebrew calendar and based on his current teaching, it just works out that way. So if that makes more sense to you. Now, if this day was to happen, um, it is going to happen on the property of Restored Church of God? Well, it would happen depending on which he doesn't get specific about he says the the kingdom of God will arrive or the kingdom to Israel to Jesus Christ will return. Jesus will be coming to Wadsworth because David C. Pack believes that he is the Elijah to come in Malachi. Uh, the, you know, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the Elijah, the prophet will be sent. And he sees himself as Elijah. And then he sees Elijah all through the Bible, even though in many places it's not Elijah at all. But he interprets it as such. So therefore, Jesus Christ would have to come to headquarters campus of Wadsworth, Ohio, take David C. Pack, raise him up, imbue him with with power so that he could speak to the entire world. So every human being on the face of the earth, on the days that these are talking, that he talks about, regardless of where you are, you could be out you know, fishing in the middle of a lake. And when David C. Pack is Elijah, you're going to hear his voice. So this would be a global event. Yes, Jesus would technically come. uh, I've heard different ways of being taught, but most likely coming to Jerusalem first, either bringing RCG there or being in Jerusalem, then coming to Wadsworth, um, giving them power and authority. And then he goes back up to heaven for whatever period of time is on Dave Pack's mind. Sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's a day. You never know. You just have to keep listening to him. And then the members of the Restored Church of God turn invisible. David C. Pack turns invisible. (laughs) And you will hear his voice, but you will not see him. Now, there are verses in the Bible that, I mean, all this stuff may sound, you know, really out there, but there's ways to interpret scriptures in the Bible to where you could kind of see where his private interpretation is coming in. But that's what he does. He, He gives private interpretation. This is not... There are scriptures that he quotes that are accurate, but how he's accurate, uh, how he is teaching them is not accurate. Now, what happens to everybody who is not a member of RCG? You get an opportunity, Don Blue, to learn the truth, the gospel, the kingdom of God, and accept God as he is. 
with David C. Pack as the Elijah, as the seventh angel of Revelation who gives out uh, the gospel to the world. God gives every human being, and this is true, God gives every human being on the face of the planet an opportunity to serve him. Depending upon your theology and thinking, if you were in the Worldwide Church of God under Herbert W. Armstrong or RCG, you know, there's there's different ways to look at does God or how much does God give you an opportunity before world punishment comes? World punishment comes in the form of, you know, the Great Tribulation, which, you know, most people know about that. They think of it as Armageddon, but Armageddon is is later, and Armageddon is just a location. It's not necessarily a thing. But that's what will happen. Everyone will have an opportunity. You can hear the voice of David C. Pack and believe him, and then God will protect you and bless you and help you to walk in his ways before world punishment comes. So everybody gets a chance. So there's there's a good side to this, even if David C. Pack is a false preacher and a false minister, there are certain truths, and that's the problem. It's the blending of truth and error in what he teaches. How does he excuse himself for all this? Well, the Bible condemns false prophets pretty plainly and, and in multiple places. He gets around this by saying, well, I'm not a prophet now, or um, I'm going to, in this past summer, he said, I'm going to de- demystify what it is to be a prophet, because we all have the wrong perception of what a prophet really is. And he says, well, I don't hear God's voice, and he's not, you know, talking to me, and I don't have visions, I'm just teaching what the Bible says. So, so he tries to find a way to get out of um, being labeled as a prophet by saying, I'm, you know, I'm telling, I'm not foretelling. I'm just putting the pieces together. So he's basically equates himself to being like a biblical mathematician where he's just putting the numbers together and coming out with an equation that points to um, a date. The problem is the verses that counter setting dates and the, the, the verses that counter being a false prophet. When, when it says, I will not, you know, if a false prophet, if somebody does not give you a sign or a wonder, or they give you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder come not to pass, be not afraid of him. And so, even though David C. Pack wants to put a, you know, happy face and, a, and wrap it in a nice wrapper, yeah. that he's not technically a prophet, he's actually somebody who's teaching the Bible, he's still giving a, quote, sign or a wonder. And what bigger sign or wonder is there than the return of Jesus Christ? What kind of techniques is he using there's a lot of manipulation and mind control going on in restore church of god i've been doing a series of articles on exrcg.org because his techniques are becoming more and more apparent there's a lot of gaslighting where he will tell you something that is completely the opposite of what is true like brethren we're still on time everything's right on track everything's fine it's like the house is on fire. How could you say everything's fine? He will take words in the Hebrew or in the Greek, um, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Sometimes each Hebrew word in, you read in the Bible, for those who don't know, there's something called the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, where it actually has the original Hebrew and the original Greek with various definitions. So one word could have two meanings, but one, some words have like 20 or 30 possible meanings. He will find the one meaning out of that list of 30, whether it's in the Bible or not, like used elsewhere in that way, but as part of the definition, and he will extract that piece out and put it into the verse because it now says exactly what he needs to say at the time. So he plays a lot of word games, and when that doesn't work for him anymore, he is very... um, He's very usual with putting the word back the way it was, but he won't tell you, oh, I'm putting this back. Not all the time. Sometimes he does, but most of the time it's he'll just read it the way it always was before because his prophetic construct failed. And so he has to go back to the drawing board and basically admit that, you know, that word seven actually just meant the number seven. It didn't mean a week. And by weeks, it didn't mean years. So there's a lot of changing the words, changing the language, and, you know, propagandists know that if you can control the language, you can control the thinking. And it's a sad thing to to think about that you have a minister who claims the name of, you know, under the authority of Jesus Christ, and he's manipulating people. He's using tactics that confuse you, 
he will move things around and as if it's like no big deal and 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 change words and just read right past it and it's like wait wait what or he'll paraphrase a verse while he reads it reinterpreting every single word like one of his favorites is in Habakkuk too where he's you know rush, rushing to call it out and making it plain and this one drove me nuts when i was an attendee because that's not what the verse says but he makes it seem that way. And the, if you read the verse in Habakkuk 2, it sounds like, I mean, in the Bible, it's two different people. Habakkuk, you make it plain so that someone else rushing past it can understand it. But he takes it as to he's making it plain and he's rushing it out. So it, it's just things like that. But there's a lot of manipulation. and and um, How are those not forms of lying, though? Well, they are. You hit the nail on the head. Of course, he's lying. He has to. He he cannot continue to set dates for the return of Jesus Christ. He cannot have a, a series that's now at 435 parts across seven plus years that he keeps repeating the same things over and over again. And yet every time it's like we're still on track. Everything's still well. Everything's still wonderful. Oh, all the ministers agree. This is the most exciting message you'll ever hear. It's the most, I'm, you know, this is like the message that I'm most privileged in my whole life to, to be able to deliver to you. And, you know, God couldn't possibly come until we knew this now. I mean, that's, he just, he'll, he'll just keep doing that because he's not getting resistance. The ministers aren't resisting him. The brethren aren't resisting him. And so basically the more he fools himself, he fools the brethren. But I don't know if they're being fooled or they're just voluntarily allowing it to happen and just, you know, hoping that it just stops one day or God will just do something. But the problem is, is that he's just going to continue. He's going to continue to lie. And more recently, the lies have gotten bigger. And the more he can get away with it, the more encouraged he'll be just to continue. So the big question that everybody will ask is, why do the people there stay then? That, that's a question for the ages, and, and there's not one answer because every individual is different. I know why I stayed as long as I did. I know Jessica stayed for as long as she did. And there are people that just left within the last couple of weeks, and they, you know, they it's like Popeye, it's all I can stand, I can't stand no more. Why people stay, There's it, it's a very tight-knit social structure. You are being told every week that you're special, that God is using you specifically and he's going to give you great power and you're going to be able to help millions and billions of people in the kingdom who doesn't want to help other people it's like all you got to do is just suffer through this confusing time of oh we got the date wrong because god did this or god wanted to test us there's always an explaining away of the failure and the falseness of it and they are, it, you know, they have family that are there. They have, you know, I can think specifically to the people at headquarters. You know, there's one man there that he has his, his wife and kids are all employed by the church. He lives on the campus. So that's a lot to give up. And the problem is that, you know, standing on your principles is sometimes costly and it's sometimes dangerous and it's really scary. All the ministers that have left Restore Church of God knew that they were giving up a lot and didn't know what they were going to do. Uh, one guy was, you know, he and his family moved out and they were like living in a motel for a while and then living with their in-laws before they could get settled. But they knew looking back, it was the right decision. So it's a hard thing to leave because you're leaving your religious, your faith background, everything you believed. You know, we all proved that Restored Church of God was the true church. I proved it. I proved it. I gave all. I sacrificed. I left California, took a 50% pay cut, came out here to Ohio. You know, I worked and served and spent Sundays, you know, getting up early to go spread mulch on the campus because I believed it. It was just over time, you cannot help but wonder, like, something is wrong here. Why people are still there now, I don't know. And I, it's like, I don't want to judge the people that are still there but it's some parts of me are like, how can they believe this? He just said this one day and then throws it out the next day and everybody's just quiet and fine with it. And it's like the Bible does talk about people asleep at the end times and that they're lukewarm. The, the Laodiceans are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. And more and more it's coming into focus that I think the people are just willfully 
blind. It's not an affliction of blindness. It's a willful blindness. So I think the people that are staying there now, they may just hope that one day Mr. Pack will get it right. They hope that, you know, God will intervene. But I think most of them just, they're on autopilot. Okay, fine. I'm just going to, you know, stay as long as I can and hopefully God will work this out. So what can, so the other big question besides is why are they staying? What can people do, family, friends, people do, those that are still there to help? Be supportive. Hey, 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 be understanding. Be patient with them. Um, telling them that they're stupid or crazy for believing that crazy cult uh, I can be kind of sharp in my language in some of the articles. I mean, I have a lot of empathy for the brethren because I, you know, was in that position. But when the lies are so big and so frequent, you have to wonder, like, what are you thinking? It's like being in a marriage where, you know, you were married for 20 years and now the marriage has gone bad and you want to stick with it for another 20 years, even though the, now the marriage is bad. It's because you invested so much. So if family members can see it as that way, it's like asking them to leave and get divorced. And, you know, what family wants to get involved with like, oh, you know, my, my, my son-in-law is cheating on my daughter and I want her to get out, but you know, how much can you push? You can, you know, it's like, you got to handle it almost the same way. It's, it's a very delicate process because you don't want to alienate them, but at the same time, you don't want to like enable an addict. And uh, sometimes I equate the brethren as to being addicts. You can't help an addict until they want to get sober. So if people approach the members of the restored church of God, like they're in abused marriage and addicts, if you handle them the same way, then that's probably the most appropriate um, course is just being firm, being understanding, but also, but also, you know, holding them accountable. Now you have still done articles. How many are you up to? There's 167 articles that I've written, but I also have uh, contributors that are growing over time. I've had, uh, you know, Jessica Brown has written a couple articles for the website. And I've encouraged other people to, if they want to publish their exit letters, to go ahead and, you know, submit them to me and I'll help them with that. If they want their name and their uh, face out there, like uh, Richard Nolan, he wrote an article. Uh, Elizabeth O'Leary Noble wrote her exit letter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, folks. Uh, and then also wrote a couple articles where she was kind of working things out. I know Elizabeth is kind of, you know, picking up the pieces for herself. So she's kind of gone quiet in that way. I know that she says she's want to do things, but, you know, everybody's handling, you know, this is trauma. This leaving a restored church of God is life trauma and everybody handles it in their different ways. And, you know, it's some of them feel very cathartic about writing about it. Like I was so grateful for Elizabeth to do it because what, what she wrote was powerful and other people have responded to it. And then more recently, Scott Steele has been contributing to the website. And I've actually become good friends with Scott. We get on the phone all the time. And when we'll, we'll listen to a sermon, he'll listen to a sermon. And um, I'm like, Scott, did I hear this correctly? Was Dave saying this? Because David C. Pack as you know, as an eloquent speaker, as he likes to believe himself to be sometimes makes absolutely no sense. He butchers what he's saying. He stutters, he mumbles. It's, it's, you know, I I've said in articles that I feel like he's deteriorating and that's seems to be the case because his communication style has, has plummeted as far as quality is concerned, because even if you want to pay attention to what he's saying, sometimes I have to listen to him four five, six, seven times. What is he saying? I don't understand it. Now the Bible says that the wise will understand and the wicked shall not understand. And so the, the, you know, people in restored who, who watch this will go, Oh, Mark's wicked. So therefore he won't understand. It's like, yeah, I'd like to see you make sense of it. You tell me how, how this makes sense because sometimes it doesn't. Um, so the, the, what I do an analysis in the, in the articles and then the other contributors, you know, contribute to, to their stories to kind of show that, you know, people, people are not alone. So that's, and I encourage anybody, if they want to contact uh, me through the website, it's exrcg, uh, exrcgwebsite at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and make sure that uh, we attach that information at the end of this video so people can see it. Oh, and I forgot one more thing. Yeah. 
before we go because it sounds like you're wrapping up are you wrapping up mm-hmm. um the biggest thing more recently was about um david c pack changing the second passover so that's kind of you know it comes back to your question about is he lying the lies have become so big that people are continually um accepting it and if he can get away with this and he can get with it, away with anything so just this past week he was teaching and i'll try not to get in the weeds too much that ir 15 is the second passover when the bible says ir 14 is the passover second passover and he's doing this because he's setting the date the cinco de mayo date that i mentioned mm-hmm. is technically the second passover and in Numbers 9, uh, you know, the people of, Moses, uh, of Israel came to Moses and said, some people were unclean because they, uh, they were unclean or in a far journey. What do they do about the Passover? And so God said, OK, you can have a second Passover in the second month. But David C. Pack is now saying and he he talked about the second Passover, but he never went to the verses. He referred to them like I referred to them. But he never went and read them. And I realized he he didn't want people to know what the verses actually say because he was changing the date without telling them he was changing the date. And that's that's one of the that also goes back to one of the techniques that he uses. He will tell you something as if it's fact. But if you go back and fact check him, you'll find out he's wrong. Now, why he did this, I don't know. Didn't pe- weren't people going to look it up? Didn't headquarters ministry look it up? I, I tried to. I called Dr. Tim Ranney at headquarters of Restore Church of God to get confirmation and kind of just ask him as a follow up, like, you know, about the teaching. He never he never got back to me, which is funny because he's the public relations guy. Dr. Tim Ranney is his job to answer questions and he didn't want to answer my questions. So he never called me back. Dr. Ranney, you have my number. You can call me. I will totally still talk to you because I'm really dying to know because RCG sent out a notice saying that IR14 was the second Passover on the very day that Dave Pack said it's IR15. So which is it? Is RCG changing doctrine? Are they changing policy? Was David C. Pack mistaken? But the fact that Dave didn't want to read the verses tells me it was a conscious choice. And if it was a conscious choice, that means he was deceiving the brethren because how do you how do you get out of that is that the same as any denomination just changing something in the book well sure tell the you know tell catholics that the that the sabbath is on saturday tell them the the muslims that the their sabbath is on thursday it's changing any date in the bible by disregarding it is going against the word of god and to teach it but doing it in a deceptive manner is the danger because I at first didn't even catch that. I didn't even think to, to fact check him. And I listened to the whole article. I wrote an article. I let it sit for a day. It felt off to me, but I couldn't put my finger on it because I never looked up the verses. He, it was so foundational to everything he's teaching now that IR 15 is the second Passover. But if you read your Bible, it says on the 14th day of the second month. It's the 14th, not the 15th. RCG sent out a notice saying that we were observed the second Passover on Thursday night. David C. Pack says you observe it on Friday. So (laughs) which, well, which is it? So RCG doctrine or uh, publications were countering what the pastor general was saying. So that's kind of the biggest thing that I've, I've written about. And actually the most shocking because either He's changing the doctrine without telling you he's changing the doctrine, which he does that too. He'll change something without telling you he just changed it. Or he was wrong. And if he was wrong, it means he's incompetent and reporters are incompetent and that is all his assistants are incompetent. So you can either say, you can choose on the bright side to say David C. Pack is incompetent, or you could be a little more pessimistic and call him a liar. <laughs> so th- those are the two choices. And I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's no, kind of like the biggest is... deal that just happened this week. And that's the latest article. What number? Oh, that's 167. 167. Yeah, the, the false Passover. I go into detail. I quote, vote, I quote the scriptures, but then I use his quotes where he <laughs> read or he didn't even read it. He paraphrased and went past the facts. And then I stop and show the Bible. So in a way, it's like I'm using the Bible more effectively than David C. Pack is. And that's kind of a weird place to be because I'm I'm not a minister. I'm not ordained. I'm just some, you know, some guy with a website. Well, thank you for the updates. Uh, 
please make sure to check out the website, the Facebook, um, all the articles and reach out. We'll make sure that we attach that information so that you can find that. And interestingly, in part 10 is going to be a little sneak peek of what it's going to be. It's going to be um, some actual videos in regards to common. So what David C. Pack, you'll actually hear his words and see him say it. So because Don and Blue and I can talk about, oh, Dave Pack said this, David C. Pack said that. It's another thing to actually sit and listen to him do that, because some people can think that, oh, you guys are exaggerating. It's a mischaracterization. Oh, you're just bitter. It's like, you know what? Just sit back and let the guy <laughs> tell you himself and you decide whether or not we're making this stuff up. Well, thank you so much, and we will see you on our next episode. Thank you. You are watching WCTV, Wadsworth Community Television.